Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this series, this is lesson one in a new series entitled The Great Controversy. Now, The Great Controversy is a big deal for Seventh-day Adventists, so we're going to try to discover why that is. This lesson number one for April 6th of 2024 is entitled the war behind all wars. Now that ought to be something. <laughs> Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we realize that this is a huge topic. We realize that it's important for us to understand all the implications. Help us to do that this evening with our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. What is the war behind all wars? Is that like the war to end all wars? You've heard that expression before. Jim? From the Bible study guide. If God is so good, why is the world so bad? How can a God of love allow so much evil to exist? Why do bad things happen to good people? In this week's lesson, we will explore the age-long conflict between good and evil, beginning with Lucifer's rebellion in heaven. We will examine the origin of evil and God's long-suffering in dealing with the sin problem. God is a God of incredible love. His very nature is love, 1 John 4, 7 and 8. All of his actions are loving, Jeremiah 31, 3. Love can never be forced, coerced, or legislated. Ellen White states it well when she writes, only by love is love awakened, Desire of Ages, page 22. Uh, to deny the power of choice is to destroy the ability to love, and to dis destroy the ability to love is to eradicate the possibility of being truly happy. God wins our allegiance by His love. He is dealing with a great controversy between good and evil in such a way that sin will never rise in the universe again. God's purpose is to demonstrate before the entire universe that He has always acted in the best interests of His creatures. Looking to the, at the world through the lens of God's love in the light of the great controversy between good and evil reassures each of us that right will triumph good and evil and reassures each of us that right will triumph over wrong and will do so forever. From the that's Bible a study guide. huge introductory statement, but that's sort of what we're trying to look at. For a much deeper understanding, and we would challenge you to do this if you can, of the challenges of this lesson, read The Great Controversy of Balan White, chapters 29 and 30, um, and it's pages 492 for 510. And if you have this handout, which you can get online, you can hit the little um, link. link there, the sorry, link. and it'll take you there. Can you imagine what it was like to have war on heaven? What kind of freedom does God allow that would make it possible to have war in the presence of an all-powerful God? I mean, that, that should be a, it should be, shouldn't be possible, right? Well, well they, couldn't, they, they couldn't see him. <laughs> <laughs> so they, they were free to... <laughs> okay, Charles, Revelation. Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 to 9. Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon who fought back with his angels. But the dragon was defeated and he and his angels were not allowed to stay in heaven any longer. The huge dragon was thrown out, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan that deceived the whole world. He was thrown down to earth and all his angels with him. This is good news translation. Okay, so we do not know what kind of weapons were used in that war. Was it just a war of ideas? Were there actually some physical weapons? What we do know is that at the end of that war, Satan and his followers were cast out of heaven. Was that physically thrown out? This one was physically, I believe. Yeah. But, but then, uh, if there was really a uh, weapon used, Satan would not be here. Yeah. Well, what do we know about Satan and his thinking before his fall that could possibly have led him to make such a foolish decision? Jennifer? From Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 12 to 15. Mortal man, he said, 
Grieve for the fate that is waiting for the King of Tyre. Tell him what I, the Sovereign Lord, am saying. You were once an example of perfection. How wise and handsome you were. You lived in Eden, the garden of God, and wore gems of every kind, rubies and diamonds, topaz, beryl, carnelian and jasper, sapphires, emeralds, and garnets. You had ornaments of gold. They were made for you on the day you were created. Does I that mean that God made them for him? Sounds like well, it. Well, yes. Like it. Seems like it. Yes. So should uh, people today be wearing those gems? If he made you that way. <laughs> no, I, Did you wear those gems? He didn't make Jennifer? <laughs> I'm sorry for the interruption. Go ahead. Okay. I put a terrifying angel there to guard you. You lived on my holy mountain and walked among sparkling gems. Your conduct was perfect from the day you were created until you began to do evil from the Good News Bible. Now that passage and the one coming up are addressed to what a initially sounds like a human being. But we know in light of what it says, all the wording and so forth there, that he's talking as he does is in a number of places in the Bible. Uh, he's talking about a human being, but he's really talking about, remember when, when Peter said, oh, you're the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And oh, no, I'm sorry, he said that. And then Jesus said, well, this is what's gonna happen to me. And Peter said, no, you can't do that. And Jesus says, get thee behind me, Satan. Mm -hmm. So he's talking not right at Peter, but what was behind that statement. And this is what's happening here. You want to go ahead and read the next one there? Sure. Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 to 14. King of Babylonia, bright morning star, you have fallen from heaven. In By the, the way, let me interrupt again. Bright morning star, what's that in Latin? Lucifer. Lucifer, yes. Go ahead. In the past, you conquered nations, but now you have been thrown to the ground. You were determined to climb up to heaven and to place your throne above the highest stars. You thought you would sit like a king on that mountain in the north where the gods assemble. You said you would climb to the tops of the clouds and be like the Almighty. Good news, Bible. So what has been Satan's goal ever since that rebellion in heaven? To be like, be like the Almighty. Yep, he wants to be right up there with God. The problem is he doesn't realize he's just a creature. Well, he, he, he has to realize that in somewhere deep well, in, his, in his brain, but... <laughs> I, like, I, I like years ago, I learned uh, Satan was the first evolutionist. Mm -hmm. He thought God just evolved to this higher position and he built a barrier to keep everybody else from getting there. <laughs> okay. It was a good metaphor. Lucifer is described as being the leader of the angels. He was a very intelligent and wonderful angel standing beside the throne of God. His name means light bearer. It was his duty to carry or communicate messages from God to other beings in the universe. But he began to covet the position of Jesus Christ. This thinking grew until he proposed open rebellion against Christ. Ellen White suggests that God gave Lucifer multiple opportunities to return to his original position and give up his rebellious attitudes. However, Lucifer refused. Gordon? So from Great Controversy by Ellen White, <clears throat> the heavenly councils pleaded with Lucifer. The Son of God presented before him the greatness, the goodness, and the justice of the Creator <clears throat> and the sacred, unchanging nature of his law. God himself had established the order of heaven, and, and in departing from it, Lucifer would dishonor his maker and bring ruin upon himself. <clears throat> but the warning given in infinite love and mercy only aroused a spirit of resistance. Wow, <coughs> what does that say to us about God's character? Imagine someone's rebelling standing right next to you, and you love him just the same. For us, looking back at the history of the Great Controversy, as we understand it at that point, what, what we understand was going on back then, it is almost impossible for us to imagine how Lucifer could have made such a foolish choice. And even more amazing, how, how did he convince one-third of the angels to follow him? Unbelievable. We do not know how long this buildup of evil la uh, lasted in heaven. What we do realize is that every single angel had to make a choice. 
Would he remain faithful to God and to Jesus Christ, or would he choose to follow Lucifer? Lucifer claimed that angels were being deprived of freedom. He thought they needed to be allowed to make more of their own choices. To the angels, it seemed like he was going to offer greater freedom. Hmm. In the near future, everyone living here on this earth will be required to make a choice also. Same choice, really. To decide for or against Christ. On what basis would you make such a choice? Have you ever stopped to ask yourself that question? Certainly the Bible would have to be the first criterion, wouldn't it be? We know very little about what happened before Adam and Eve sinned. What we do know is found in a few verses early in Genesis. Myra? Yes, in Genesis 2, 15 to 17, it says, Then the Lord placed the man in the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and guard it. He said to him, You may eat the fruit of any tree in the garden, except the tree that gives knowledge of what is good and what is bad. You must not eat the fruit of that tree. If you do, you will die the same day. Good news, Bible. And what was the response? In Genesis 3, verses 1 to 5, Now the snake was the most cunning animal that the Lord God had made. The snake asked the woman, Did God really tell you not to eat the fruit from it? not to eat the fruit from any tree in the garden. Let me interrupt there for a second. You notice the, the wording there is Satan chose his wording here. Eve had said, you know, we're not to eat the fruit, that one tree. Well, he says, you're not supposed to eat the fruit from any tree. Yeah. So he's implying you can't eat from any tree. It just said earlier that you can eat it of all the trees in yeah. the garden. Yeah. yeah. Okay, go ahead. Verse 2, it says, We may eat the fruit of any tree in the garden, the woman answered, except the tree in the middle of it. God told us not to eat the fruit from that tree or even touch it. If we do, we will die. The snake replied, That's not true. You will not die. God said that because he knows that when you eat it, you will be like God or yeah. the gods. And the footnote is yes. alternatively. Go ahead and know what is good and what is bad. There in verse 4, where he says, that's not true. We hear that these warnings on, te on television or radio commercials, past performance is no indicator of future results. Yes. <laughs> so, and it, 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 when, when the serpent said that, he was basing his data based upon life experience. There had been no death evident in the universe. Yeah. Right, well, but he knew better. Well, we don't know that. We can't. We can't support. Him. He, he, yeah. He'd never seen death. How do you know? He, he just had the words of, of, of God well, as he, a warning. He knew better than to lie, to to, I, to call God a liar. He knew better than to call God a liar. Don't don't try to t get me out of that not, one. Uh, how much? Uh, why, why, why 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 would we say it that way though? He knew better than to call what God, what, because say, God's going to do something to him? The first what, words out of his mouth was, that's not true. I understand that. But we're calling there. God a liar. That's true. Well, what, what, he he knows better than he, that. He, what's that? Satan knows better than to call God a liar. That's, that's the bottom line. But, but uh, why, why does it... Uh, Satan, Lucifer knew that it was untrue that God was a liar. Did God he? is not a liar. Was, well, I'm, I'm, I agree God is not a liar. I've never, I'm, I'm going to need to be convinced of that. But okay. how do we know that, why, what we made, uh, did, did God make some pronounce? And, and apparently, according to John 1, 18 and 6, 46, nobody has seen the Father except the one that came from the Father, Jesus. And uh, so nobody had seen him. How do they know what, what God, uh, how he well, deals with lies? Lucifer knew because he stood at the, beside the throne of God for maybe millions of years. He certainly should have known. Uh, well, let's, let's go on. We got a lot about it. We, we don't know what, what the, uh, he, how he came to the conclusion. Uh, we, there's no, been, no evidence that there had ever been death up until that time. Yeah. And, and there's no argument about that. That's not the argument. The question is, he's calling God a liar, and we I'm, know that he had evidence that God was not a liar. 
Well, I, it, I, I, this was not the only time. Process. This was not the only time in Bible in the Bible when the spiritual leaders challenged their followers to make choices. And some examples are Moses and Joshua and um, and Elijah and John, and just those places: Exodus, Joshua, First Kings, and Revelation. God created us to love Him, but in order to love, we must have freedom. God did not create robots. See the handout on love under there. You can get it if you've got the website. We are required to make moral choices. We were intended to be living and acting in God's image. So our Bible study guy goes on to say, when God created the earth, he created it perfect. The Bible says that he saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good, Genesis 1.31. There was no stain of sin or evil anywhere, but he gave Adam and Eve the same freedom of choice he had given to Lucifer. He didn't want robots on earth any more than he wanted robots in heaven. Unfor and that's from our Bible study guide. Unfortunately, as we know, Satan was cast down to this earth as recorded in Revelation 12, 7 and 9 that Charles read for us earlier. He was given a position in the Garden of Eden at the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Many Christians regard the tree of knowledge of good and evil as an opportunity for God to test Adam and Eve. I believed that for a long time. That is not a complete representation of the facts. The tree was not placed in the garden primarily to test or tempt Adam and Eve. God does not test. It was placed there as a protection by limiting the access that Satan would have to our first parents. Satan could not follow them wherever they went, trying to tempt them at every corner. The great controversy had already started, and God knew what Satan was capable of doing. That's a, that Jim? paragraph right there, paragraph 15, is, is excellent. In well, my, my here's Ellen here. White's confirmation of that. You want to read it for us? Is it my turn? You, yeah. The tree of knowledge, excuse me, the tree of knowledge had been made a test of their obedience and their love to God. The Lord has been, seen fit to lay upon them one prohibition as to the use of all that was in the garden. But if they should disregard his, the, excuse me, if they should disregard his will and his, in this particular they would incur the guilt of, of transgression. Satan was not to follow them with continual temptations. He would have them He only, could have. He could have. He access, could have. To, access to them. Why is my, my, my eyes are starting around here? He could have access to them only at the forbidden tree. There we go. Should they attempt to investigate his nature, they would be exposed to his wiles. They were admonished to give careful heed to the warning which God had sent them and to be content with the instructions which he had seen fit to impart. Ellen White, Patriarchs Prophet, and Prophets, page 60, 53. I have you know, Ellen White, I, I mean, excuse me, <laughs> Ellen White, getting her mixed up with Eve. Eve had a predisposition and she just, yeah, well, Satan just. I, I, you know, we know that the tree of knowledge of good and evil was placed in the center of the garden, close to the tree. I mean, that's a well, fantastic. but just a minute, close to the tree of life. Yeah. So I would say it would be all right to stay at a distance and wave if you want to. That would be okay. <laughs> just, oh. just don't go over there. That was the whole point. All you got to do to prevent any problems is just stay away from there. When Eve made the mistake of wandering close to the tree of knowledge, she was engaged in a conversation by what appeared to be a snake. Almost immediately, the snake said that what God had told her there, had God had told them, was a lie. And we've just looked at those verses. Eve started that first sin by trusting the creature in the tree, taking the fruit, eating, and then giving it to Adam. He followed her example setting a pattern for every human being who has ever lived on this earth except Jesus. Romans 3.23 tells us exactly what that means. Charles? Thank you. Everyone has sinned and is far away from God's saving presence. Goodness, Bible. You want to go ahead and do the Bible study guide right there? Uh, yeah. At its very core, sin is rebellion against God. Sin separates us from God. Since God is the source of life, 
separation from God leads to death. It also leads to worry, anxiety, sickness, and disease. The suffering in our world is ultimately the result of living on a sin-ravaged planet. This certainly does not mean that every time we suffer, we have sinned. It does mean that every one of us is affected by living on this planet. Yeah, from our Bible study guide for yes. Tuesday. And then, of course, the Isaiah Bible verse. Mm -hmm. It is because of your sin that he does not hear you. It is your sins that separate you from God when you try to worship him. This was not for Job. <laughs> yeah. To Adam and Eve, when they were cast out of the garden, things must have seemed hopeless. But right then, God made a promise to them. Jennifer? Genesis 3, verse 15. I will make you, Satan, and the woman hate each other. Her offspring and yours will always be enemies. Her offspring will crush your head, and you will bite her offspring's heel. In the Good News Bible. We do not know how much explanation God or the angels gave Adam and Eve at that point. We have evidence from Ellen White that both God and the angels instructed Adam and Eve. We don't know how, what they have or how much they instructed them. You know, it, God could have said, there's going to be a snake in that tree and he's going to try to talk to you. He could have, but for whatever reason, God chose not to reveal those details, apparently, as far as we can tell. Um, why God limited, I mean, God knew. Uh, maybe, maybe the angels knew. Anyway. But the st angels still had a lot to learn, didn't they? Yeah. It, it wasn't until the cross that they finally got things put sorted out properly what we do know is found in galatians 3 16 way down in the new testament gordon now god made his promises to abraham and to his descendant the scripture does not use the plural descendants meaning many people but the singular descendant meaning one person only namely christ that's from the good news bible so that particular promise given to eve was a promise that someday the descendant would come, right? All through the history of our world, up to the time of Christ, people wondered what that promise involved. <clears throat> was it true what God had said about a, a sin leading to death? Is it true that God really loves us? The life and death of Jesus give us the answer. The life and death of Jesus give us a choice. We can either live lives as near as possible to the life that he lived, or we will die the death that he died, separated from his father, the only source of life. And here's the evidence for that. Myra? Yes, Mrs. White writes, but now, and this, this, is, this is, is on the cross. On the cross, yes. With the terrible weight of guilt he bears, he cannot see the father's reconciling face. The withdrawal of the divine countenance from the savior in this hour of supreme anguish, pierced his heart with a sorrow that can never be fully understood by man. So great was his agony that his physical pain was hardly felt. I'm gonna, I won't interrupt there for a second. So he began to experience a separation from the Father, which results from sin. That was the agreement that they were gonna demonstrate what happens when you get separated from God. That separation from God was so painful to him, he couldn't feel all the scars on his back, the crown of thorns on his head, all that had happened to him. Just hanging up. How, how bad do we feel every time we sin? Yeah. Mm. Satan, okay. with his fierce temptations, wrung the heart of Jesus. The Savior could not see through the portals of the tomb. Hope did not present him to him his coming forth from the grave a conqueror or tell him that the father's accept, uh, of the father's acceptance of his sacrifice he feared that sin was so offensive to god that their separation would be eternal that was yeah. had to have been incredible just yeah, I, as it says we humans cannot fully understand yeah um, Christ felt the anguish which 
the sinner will feel when mercy is no longer shall no longer shall no longer plead for the guilty race. And when is that going to be? At the third coming. At the third coming. The it feeling was, they will the, the, what sinners will feel at the third coming is what Jesus felt on the cross. Okay? It was a sense of sin being the father's wrath upon him as a man's as man's substitute that made the cup he drank so bitter and broke the heart of the son of god and fortunately having read through the bible several times we've discovered that the wrath of god means what separation separation from god by because of our own choices we just read it up there isaiah 59 verse 2 said the same thing who could have imagined God's answer to the sin problem. Try to imagine Jesus, the creator of the entire universe, coming down, entering into the womb of a human mother, and being born as a helpless baby boy to live that incredible life and die that awful death. What does that tell us about his love for us? I mean, apparently, with God's foreknowledge, he knew that whole life story before he showed up as a baby boy. I don't think he understood it all when he was a baby boy, but he knew that but when he, he made that choice. The, to make that choice, yeah. to leave his father, knowing what he knew, uh, it's incredible. It's mm -hmm. just... One of the greatest trials that Jesus endured was the misunderstanding and misrepresentations of the Pharisees and Sadducees. They were sure that a poor rabbi from Galilee could not possibly be the Messiah. They were sure. It was just clear in their theology. Well, they wanted someone to come like King David. Yeah. Get these guys out of here. Right. Romans have no business being here. Yeah. But one thing, though, um, with this second nature, uh, nature of uh, uh, God the Son, mm -hmm. he knew what was going on. If, mm -hmm. I believe even as a child, I ran into trouble with uh, Adventist uh, college and when he, uh, the professor says, well, as a child, he must have uh, committed some uh, sins. Oh, no. There's no, no, no way. Absolutely no way. No, no. Absolutely no way. I don't know at what age, but I do know that Ellen White says when he's still quite young, he would commune with his father every day and his father instructed him. Well, at age 12, when he visited yeah. the temple, it was... Sure. He, knew he, he, he had to have known by then and before then mm -hmm. what was going on. Yeah. That he was God, that what his mission was. And I mean, imagine God coming down and telling us, say, a six-year-old, oh, by the way, you're God. Wow. <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, how would you sort of break that to him? Well, God said, God said we've already looked at that, that sin leads to death, Genesis 2, 17. Satan said that it does not, Genesis 3, 4. We looked at that also. On the cross, Jesus died this, what we call the second death, which is the death that is a direct result of sin, which no one else in history has died in order to prove the truth of his words in Genesis 2 about sin causing death. God was proven to have told the truth. Satan was proven to be the liar. So at the end of the prophecy of 2300 days described in Daniel 8:14, Jesus took up an important new work. That work is described in Zechariah 3, 1 to 5 and Daniel 7, 9 to 10. Where are we here? It's your, it's your, yes. That's what I thought. Zechariah 3, 1 to 5. In another vision, the Lord showed me the high priest, Joshua, standing before the angel of the Lord. And there beside Joshua stood... Satan, ready to bring an accusation against him. And we already read in Revelation 12, Satan is called the what? Oh, Accuser of yeah. brother of our brothers and sisters, right? Ready to bring an accusation against him. The angel of the Lord said to Satan, may the Lord, that's Yahweh, condemn you, Satan. May the Lord who loves Jerusalem condemn you. This man is like a stick snatched from the fire. Joshua was standing there wearing filthy clothes. The angel said to the heavenly attendants, take away the filthy clothes the man is wearing. Now, it doesn't tell us up above there who the angel of the Lord is in this case, but who is it that gives orders to the angels of heaven? Michael the archangel. Jesus. <laughs> Michael the archangel. Jesus. Has to be Jesus. Right. Yeah. 
take away the filthy clothes this man is wearing. Then he said to Joshua, I have taken away your sin. And who has the ability to do that? Only God. Only Jesus, yeah. And will give you the new clothes to wear. He commanded the attendants to put a clean turban on Joshua's head. They did so, and then they put the new clothes on him while the angel of the Lord stood there. And what else do we know about that court scene? Daniel 7, 9 and 10 tells us, While I was looking, thrones were put in place. One who had been living forever. Who do you think that would be? Has to be God, right? Mm -hmm sat down on one of the thrones. His clothes were white as snow and his hair was like pure wool. His throne mounted on fiery wheels was blazing with fire and a stream of fire was pouring out from it. Another reason why it had to be God. <laughs> there were many thousands of people there to serve him and millions of people stood before him. The court began its session and the books were opened. So guess who's in charge of the judgment? No one could say that Christ does not understand our situation. He was tempted in every way. Jim? Hebrews 4, 50, verses 15 and 16. Our high priest is not one who can feel sympathy for our weaknesses. Who on, excuse me, on the contrary, we have a high priest who was tempted in every way that we are, but did not sin. Let us have confidence then and approach God's throne where there is a grace, there we will receive mercy and find grace to help us when we need it. Good News Bible. As incredible as it may seem, Jesus went back to heaven and told those inhabitants of heaven that his greatest wish was to bring some of us there to live with them for the rest of eternity. Was that a shock treatment or what? <laughs> well, here's what he said about that. Charles? John 17. Father, John 17, uh, 24 to 26. Father, this is Jesus uh, praying to... Uh, his Father. Yeah, wait, right, to His Father. You have given them to me, and I want them to be with me where I am, so that they may see my glory, the glory you gave me. For you loved me before the world was made. Righteous Father, the world does not know you, but I know you, and these know that you sent me. I made you known to them, and I will continue to do so, in order that the love you have for me may be in them, and so that I also may be in them. That's an incredible yes. prayer. Beautiful prayer. He wants to have his, he wants us to have such a close relationship to him, it's like the relationship between him and his father. This is really the Lord's Prayer, yeah. John chapter 17. Exactly, right? yeah. Yes. Well, Ellen White, Jennifer, you want to take that up there? Sure, Ellen White, um, from Ellen G. White, from The Great Controversy. When the great sacrifice had been consummated, Christ ascended on high, refusing the adoration of angels until he had presented the request, quote, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am. So there's the there's the request right there, right? Yes. Okay. From John 17, 24. Then with inexpressible love and power came forth the answer from the Father's throne. Quote, let all the angels of God worship him. End quote. Hebrews 1, 6. Not a stain rested upon Jesus. His humiliation ended, his sacrifice completed, there was given unto him a name that is above every name. From Philippians 2, verses 10. Yeah, guess where that comes from? Philippians 2, 10 and 11. <laughs> Why do you think Jesus was willing to come and die for us? Why would you think we are so valuable to him in the great controversy over God's character and government? Gordon? From the great controversy, a couple of quotes. In the banishment of Satan from heaven, God declared his justice and maintained the honor of his throne. But when man had sinned through yielding to the deceptions of this apostate spirit, God gave an evidence of his love by yielding up his only begotten son to die for the fallen race. In the atonement, the character of God is revealed. The mighty argument of the cross demonstrates to the whole universe that the course of sin, which Lucifer had chosen, was in no wise chargeable upon the government of God. God was Amen. not to blame. 
and that's from page 500. And then from page 503 of Great Controversy, the cross of Calvary, while it declares the law, the law immutable, proclaims to the universe that the wages of sin is death. In the Savior, Savior's expiring cry, it is finished, the death knell of Satan was rung. The great controversy, which had been so long in progress, was then decided, and the final eradication of evil was made certain. The Son of God passed through the portals of the tomb, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil, Hebrews 2.14. And that's quoting Ellen White, page 503. Wonderful. This information that we have studied should raise several very important questions in your mind. I mean, these are huge ideas. They should make you think rumbling should be going around in your brain. Jesus, by the way, we all know, he was the only one who could have done it. Yeah. He could have said no. Yeah, yeah he was he the only freedom. one who could have done it. He had freedom to choose. It. Yeah, uh, and that's number one. Number two, uh, some the Adventists seem to have, have the are the only ones, it seems like, who have a grasp of why Jesus had to die on the cross. Now, why, why is everyone else saying, well, he nailed the law on the cross, and yeah. if indeed, <laughs> why would you want to destroy something? Then he could have said, no, law, law is not in business anymore, so yeah. he would not have to die on the cross. So why would he nullify yeah, they, there's, the, the logic doesn't hold together It there. does not. And um, just last Friday evening, on the other side of the world, I didn't realize in the audience were Catholics, and they invi oh. invited me to speak. Uh -huh. This was just a few days ago. This was a Christian group, and I'm speaking to them, and speaking on things of health, but also on faith. And I went into talking about the Jesuits, and da, da, da. But they all really, truly really liked for the time we are living in. Mm -hmm. They wanted me to go back, and we're going to go back and speak with them. Same way, by the way, um, if I could, even Muslims, they have a concept, but they cannot fathom why would Jesus have to die on the cross, even though the Quran talks about mm -hmm. that Jesus would die and be resurrected. But we really truly have a beautiful message, yeah. beautiful, beautiful message to share. Okay. Well. Wow. Number one, yes, from the Bible study guide of the questions, the very important questions. Yes. If God knew that Lucifer was going to rebel, why did he give him the power of choice in the first place? That's a question first, I've heard first. arise. Yes. Or when Lucifer rebelled, why didn't God just annihilate him immediately? Yes. Yes. Oh, there'd be many rebels, right? <laughs> And then, um, what kind of reaction might the fallen, unfallen universe have had God immediately wiped Lucifer out? Desire of Ages. From yeah, if you read the chapter, it is finished. And in, in Desire of Ages, especially those two pages, you'll get the answer. Uh, why is the concept of the universe's interest in the plan of salvation? so important to the understanding of the great controversy. You can't fully comprehend the biblical concept of the great controversy without including the entire universe. It just changes the whole picture if you realize even the unfallen worlds need what was accomplished by the, by the cross and in the great controversy. What reasons or what reason or reasons can you think of for Christ's death on the cross? Well, we could spend the whole rest of the night talking about that. Was it only to reveal the character of God? Was it to pay the ransom price for sin? If so, to whom was the ransom paid? Hmm. Maybe I, I'd, I'd like to quote uh, Psalms, I think chapter four, five, that thou, O God, may be justified. Mm -hmm. Yep. When thou speakest. That's yep. in Romans 3. In Romans and 3. also in Psalms. Yeah. Psalms, yes. Oh, well, that's Psalms. Yes. It's, no, it's from Psalm 51. It's, yeah. That's 51, right, yeah. 4 or something like that. Yeah. So, if so, to who was ransom paid, share your thoughts and give biblical reasons for them. That's a challenge we'd like to throw out to all of you because those are the kind of questions that people will be raising and we need to be ready with the answers. 
And probably the key part is give biblical reasons for yes. that, for your for your thoughts. So, uh, go ahead, Myra. Three. Uh, number three. When we use the term the great controversy, what do we mean? Discuss the various aspects of the great controversy and how this week's lesson applies to your own life. And then four. What Bible texts talk about the reality of the great controversy? Four, let's see. We just barely touched on it. Job 1 and 2 and then Ephesians 6, 12. Can I? Uh, yeah. Um, it so happened that just a few hours earlier, I'm sitting beside a gentleman from Gambia. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you probably have been there. Yes, I and, have. And, uh, and I knew that he was different and he was, he was pressing on the beads. Mm -hmm. so I, maybe he's not a Catholic. So we started to talk and he was a teacher of Islam in an Asian country mm -hmm. and spent a year there and going back and we got to talking mm. and it came to exactly what we're talking about. And he, we, we exchanged and I gave him mine and uh, mm. his, he says he's going to write to me. We have such a beautiful message, mm -hmm. really, truly such a beautiful yeah. message. And it's time for... I it. remember oh. that in a slightly different set, setting. We were a little bit late trying to get to the airport in Istanbul. Right. And the taxi driver says, don't worry, I'll get you there. So he's driving with all the hand, he's running through with his beads with the other <laughs> one. <always. laughs> and we were <laughs> like that. But he did get us to the airport safely, on time. <laughs> His worry beads, they call them. And then another experience, I want to share this because it's going all over the world. This is, uh, they call them uh, Sufi Islam. Mm -hmm. The head of Sufi Islam, yeah. he's a diabetic. Mm -hmm. Two to three hours talking about our faith. Exactly the same thing we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Christians are, we are the only ones who have this knowledge that we've yeah. got to share. So beautiful way to share this with is with folk who are not some Adventists. Yeah. So what do we know about the Great Controversy? First of all, we know that the Great Controversy was started by a created being who doesn't want to admit that he's a created being. Lucifer, who became Satan in heaven itself. Good and evil cannot coexist throughout eternity. If evil were to be victorious, it would sooner or later destroy the entire universe. God's plan, the loving plan, must eliminate ev evil. Before Satan rebelled in heaven, there was perfect peace and harmony throughout the universe. Peace and harmony will be restored once the great controversy is over and all traces of sin and sinners are gone. However, the museum of sin and the record of what God has done to preserve love and freedom in the universe will be preserved forever. And I happen to know that um, that quote is found in Desire of Ages, page 499, if you're a listener and you want to look it up. If sin leads to death, as God has said, it must be completely and totally eliminated. May so, I, I believe that museum is going to be marks on his hands and his feet. That will certainly... I think that's all that's needed. Yeah. It'll be the whole, I think it'll be the whole record of the Bible, plus more. Yeah. Right, plus, right, right. But it's going to be so visible. Every yeah. day, you know, it's there, so. Our lesson for this week focuses on several themes. Evil and the cosmic conflict originated in a perfect heaven. They then spread to earth, taking root in the hearts and minds of free moral agents who were created in the image of God. Sin and evil, number two, became manifest as rebellion against God. And then three, the only way to salvation and to end to the end of the cosmic conflict is to the cross and to the mediation of Christ and his creative restorative power. And that would take a whole long discussion, but that is true. Some of the Adventists have a unique understanding of the great controversy. It is spelled out in, in our fundamental belief, number eight. Myra, I think that, no, it's Jennifer? Jim. Jim, Jim okay. All humanity is now involved in the great controversy between Christ and Satan regarding the character of God, his law, and his sovereignty over the universe. The conflict originated in heaven when, the created be when a created being endowed with freedom of choice and self-exaltation became Satan. 
God's adversary and led into rebellion a portion of the angels. He introduced the spirit of rebellion into the world when he led Adam and Eve into sin. The human sin resulted in the distortion of the image of God in humanity, the disordering of the cre created world and its eventual devastation at the time of the global flood was presented in the historical account of Genesis 1 to 11. Observed by the whole creation, the world became the arena of the universal conflict out of which the God of love will ultimately be vindicated. In his, excuse me, to assist his people in the controversy, Christ sends the Holy Spirit and the loyal angels to guide, protect, and sustain them in the way of salvation. And there's a whole collection of verses from the Bible that support this teaching, which we won't take time. We don't have time to look at all of them right at the moment. Once again, if you want to look up our website at theox.org, that's T-H-U-X dot O-R-G, you can download this and get all those quotes. There's more about the origin of sin in the doctrines of Seventh-day Adventists. Look at the next one. Charles? Bible study guide, the biblical teaching of humanity's fall into sin is also present in the fundamental belief number seven. Men and women, women were made in the image of God with individuality and power and freedom to think and to do. Though created free beings, each is an individual unity, un, unity of body, mind, and spirit, dependent upon God for life and breath and all else. When our first parents disobeyed God, they denied their dependence upon Him upon him and fell from their high position. The image of God in them was marred and they became subject to death. Their descendants shared this fallen nature and its consequences. They are born with weakness and tendencies to evil. But God is Christ, God in Christ reconciled the world to himself and by His Spirit restored in uh, pertinent, <clears throat> penitent mortals the image of their Maker. Created in this glory of God, they are called to love Him and one another and to care for their environment. And again, there are many... Collection of verses. Yes. So, despite having fallen and been through all these terrible things, God has made a plan for us to be restored into His image. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. Seventh-day Adventists believe the stories expressed in Genesis 1 to 11 to be historically true and accurate. That puts us in a relatively small category these days. And that the events described, uh, des described to have occurred in the Garden of Eden were real. Jennifer? From Ellen G. White in the book Education, page 190, the Bible is its own expositor. Scripture is to be compared with Scripture. The student should learn to view the Word as a whole and to see the relation of its parts. He should gain a knowledge of its grand central theme, of God's original purpose for the world, of the rise of the great controversy, and of the work of redemption. He should understand the nature of the two principles that are contending for supremacy. Now I'm going to interrupt for a second. That implies that the grand central theme of scriptures is what? The great controversy. Isn't that what that's implied right there? Okay, go ahead. And should learn to trace their working through the records of history and prophecy to the great consummation. He should see how this controversy enters into every phase of human experience, how in every act of life he himself reveals the one or the other of the two antagonistic motives, and how, whether he will or not, he is even now deciding upon which side of the controversy he will be found. Wow. Education, page 190. Seventh-day Adventists believe that the great controversy is woven throughout the entire Bible. It affects many Christian doctrines. And we just have a list of a few of those. Gordon? 
1, the teaching of creation is an expression of God's love, freedom, and power. 2, the origin of human nature, its present condition, and its, fun and its final destiny. 3, the fall of humanity from its original righteousness and communion with God. 4, God's actions of salvation as manifested in the incarnation, ministry, death, resurrection, ascension, and mediatorial ministry of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary, as well as in, the se in his second coming. <clears throat> 5, his redemptive plan of justification, sanctification, and the promise of future glorification for the human race. Wow, what a plan. 6, God's constitution of his people throughout all periods of human history, culminating in the calling out of his end time remnant from among the Protestant churches to proclaim his final invitation of mercy to humanity. Seven, the pre-advent millennial and executive judgments of God climaxing in the end of evil and in the restoration of all things from the teacher's wow. guide on page 16. Wow, okay, Myra? From the Bible study guide, it says, the great controversy is, it his, is historical in nature because traditionally Christianity integrated Greek philosophical presuppositions and concepts, which as the, as the immaterial, timeless, spaceless nature of heaven. Many Christians interpret biblical references to the cosmic conflict and of the fall of humans to sin as allegories and theological myths. However, the Adventist historically, historical gram... Ma grammatical. Histor I can't say that. Historical, historical grammatical. 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 Interruption of the Bible. Interpretation. Not interpretation. Interpretation of the Bible <laughs> presents God as personally and historically involved with the history of humanity's fall into sin and in the history of salvation. God, Lucifer, the angels, both rebellious and righteous, Adam and Eve and their fall into sin are all real historical characters and events. Jesus referred to Satan as a literal historical person, one whom Jesus knew from before the start of this earth's history and who was the originator of evil and sin. Jesus once explained to the Pharisees, and was this mm -hmm. early in his? No, uh, uh, so, uh, fairly early, yes. Yeah. Uh, Jesus once explained to the Pharisees that they were neither the children of Abraham nor the children of God, but rather were their were of their uh, were of their father, the devil, who was the murderer of from the beginning and not holding to the truth, for there was no truth in, in, in him. When he lies, he speaks this negative language, for Na he- Native language. Native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. It's also negative language. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so here's the verses, John 8, 39 to 44. They answered him, this is the, the Jewish leaders, the Sadducees and the Pharisees. They answered him, our father is Abraham. If you really were Abraham's children, Jesus replied, you would do the same things that he did. All I have ever done is to tell you the truth I heard from God, yet you are trying to kill me. Abraham did nothing like this. You are doing what your father did. God himself is the only father we have, they answered, and we are his true children. And Jesus said to them, if God really were your father, you would love me because I came from God and now I am here. I did not come on my own authority, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I say? It is because you cannot bear to listen to my message. You are, your, you are the children of your father, the devil, and you want to follow your father's desires. From the beginning, he was a murderer and has never been on the side of truth because there is no truth in him. I, I, I can view in my, <laughs> my mind's eye the looks that must have been on their faces. Well, these are the, uh, these are the church fathers. Mm -hmm. These are the big people. Yeah. And apparently, and apparently, uh, Satan, uh, the devil, had no problem c continuing to. He'd never seen any threats or intimidation by uh, Yahweh. Yeah. 
when he tells a lie, their father, he is only doing what is not natural to him because he's a liar and the father of all lies. While Revelation 12 is presented in apocalyptic prose, it clearly refers to historical events. War broke out in heaven. The devil was cast to this earth. Jesus was born. The devil did everything he could to destroy him. But God preserved him and took him to heaven. God also has preserved his faithful people down to the history of our world. Those are historical events. We know they're, they're historical events. The following verses show that all of the events from Satan's rebellion in heaven to the final events involving the Christian church all mentioned and in some cases are prophesied as truly historical events. Okay, Revelation 12. Um, I'll go ahead and read that really quick. Revelation 12, 5 and 6 and 10 and 17. This is just to, to demonstrate that these things are historical facts. Then she gave birth to a son who will rule over all nations with an iron rod. But the child was snatched away and taken to God and his throne. The woman will fled to the desert to be a place God had prepared for her where she will be taken care of for 1260 days. And we know about all the fulfillments of that. Then he heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now God's salvation has come. Now God has shown his power as king. Now as the Messiah has shown his authority. For the one who, the one who stood before our God and accused our brothers and sisters, remember Zechariah 3, day and night has been thrown out of heaven. The dragon was furious with the woman and went off to fight against the rest of her descendants, all those who obey God's commandments and are faithful to the truth revealed by Jesus. And the dragon stood on the seashore. And I'm going to jump over this next section, uh, more of the same. Consider these questions raised in the Teacher's Bible Study Guide. Jim? What do people in your culture think of the apparent existence of the conflict between good and evil, both in our world and in human, and in human his society? How do, we, how do they understand the origin of evil? Do they believe evil will ever end? Why or why not? Have they given up upon, excuse me, have they already given up on any hope of the termination of evil? If so, why? Perhaps they think evil is here to stay or is even necessary to keep some sort of balance in the universe and in history. Let me interrupt right there. We're running out of time. It's a question for you. What is it? How do you understand it? Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, we thank you for these insights which have been gathered by scholars, from Scripture and from the writings of Ellen White. We feel so blessed to have all these things presented before us in this wonderful and easy to understand way. Help us to understand it, to make it a part of our lives is our prayer in Jesus' name. Mm -hmm. Amen.